Criminal Minds Evolution. It is pronounced evolution, right? I have to ask because of the weird way that John Manzanaga pronounced it in episode 2. You know, on the previously on thing. Previously on Criminal Minds Evolution. Oh look, it's previously on. We're gonna be running through the first two episodes of the Criminal Minds reboot of sorts, as well as address what could have been written on the poster note that Penelope left for her successor in the finale. But before we do that, please leave a like and subscribe. You can always unsubscribe or at least date if you don't like where I'm posting, it's completely free and no hard feelings. If you wanna go at some other point. My voice is currently damaged, I'm just getting over COVID still, so let's do our best. Right then, let's get into it. Showtime. It's showtime, folks. So, the first elephant in the room we need to address is the fact that there's no Reed. Apparently, he isn't in the reboot because the actor wanted to venture out into his career more. Criminal Minds was his first job out of college and he never really escaped it because that show went on for like 15 years, was it? And I don't think Hotch will show up again. Gibson was fired from the original for, I believe he went old Jeremy Clarkson on someone. I think he had severe anger issues and has basically quit acting. And Shamar Moore is a lead on another show, SWAT. So I don't think his schedule would allow for an appearance. Even though it's very likely he'll get a cameo to support Penelope because she's gone through a bit of a rough time in these episodes. But anyway, I, just, I wanted to address those elephants in the room of the obvious people missing from this reboot. Right then, the first thing I want to point out is how great it is that they can swear now. When that guy was accused of being the unsub and he was showed photos of murdered people and he just started swearing his head off, it really made me laugh because that's exactly how you would react. It is a bit jarring to see Rossi dropping the F-bomb, sure. But is it funny? Definitely. I love this new freedom they've got. And it was great to see Penelope back. She is fantastic as this character and it's always great fun to watch. Having said that, if I was in a work Zoom meeting with her and she ordered me to take part in a daily dance party, I would quit my job immediately. I don't care if I was living on the streets, it's got to be a better life than having a daily Zoom dance party. Have I become a miserable old man? What am I saying? I was born a miserable old man. The part where Penelope was called by the unsub was legitimately killing. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. Chilling, I meant. <laughs> it, it took me back to the old days of Criminal Minds. I do have one minor issue with these two episodes. When Penelope dismissed her baking group, she said, Let's wrap this up, mates. We've got to wrap it up, mates. Now, I use mates pretty much daily. I am northern after all. But never have I said mates. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Also, Criminal Minds has always done this thing where it will make extras awkwardly nod in order not to have to pay them more to speak the lines. Oh, oh. It happened in the original series, although. Did you have any, uh, black light scanner? Happens again here. It's so awkward. Just pay them the extra 50 quid or whatever it is, you weirdos. I found it really sweet how nobody ever really replaced Penelope. I mean, she did that job for a long time, from season 1 to the very end. Not to mention, she was also the main computer person in the spin-off, Suspect Behaviour, with Forrest Whitaker. So when she left that note on her desk in the finale wishing well for whoever replaced her, it sort of left a weird emptiness. She was gone, and the show was over. To learn that four people tried to take on Penelope's role, but because of Covid, they were always nothing more than a box on the screen. I think that's incredibly sweet and serves the character very well. I'm glad that the note she wrote in the finale didn't go to waste, however, as she was able to read it and gain the courage to rejoin the team properly in episode 2. An incredible moment. I love that she's back. Not to mention how lovely it was seeing her get back to her desk. I half expected the first thing she would do would be to pour down all the trinkets, but instead she just logged in all serious. Seemed a little out of character, but I'm sure it won't take long. At least she played her music. Perhaps the most unbelievable part of this reboot is how quickly she updates their computer. It takes 30 minutes for my PlayStation to update and that's not connected to the FBI database. But since we've mentioned the poster notes, why don't we speculate about what it could have said? I have a theory, but I want to throw out a few possibilities. 1. It could be a reminder to always help the team. 2. It could be a note to herself. 
because she always knew she'd end up back in that chair. I doubt that one. She seemed pretty dead set on never returning, and there's no way Penelope predicted the pandemic. Three, it could be Penelope's version of Gideon's list in his notebook, something that reminds her that the darkness leads to light. Personally, I believe it wasn't a bunch of words, but a number. The amount of lives that she saved. Surely that would be enough to give her the courage to get back into the chair. That's where I think anyway. But honestly, we'll we'll never know. The showrunner said as much. It's kind of like the letter Jim wrote for Pam in the office. When talking about it, showrunner Messer said, We're never gonna know. It will be what you want it to be. Kirsten wanted it to be one thing that I didn't like, and I wanted it to be something that she didn't like. So that's the end of that, really. I'm, I'm glad the note ended up having an effect on someone, at least. I'll tell you what, this certainly isn't a show I recommend watching with your tea. That bit where the guy was given the option of them severing his spinal cord or killing him, just disgusted him. It didn't help that by the time we're recording this, my voice has only just recovered from COVID, like I said. So my stomach was on the turn already before I even started the show. Was the show always this graphic, or was it because I wasn't well? It feels like it's been so long since the show went off the air. So I can't really remember. Let me know in the comments below if it was. Does anyone else think it was a bit weird how the unsub could easily go into a hardware store and buy a kill kit? Look how suspicious he is. Nobody buys all that stuff for reasons other than kidnap and murder. Did he learn nothing from Walter White? And don't buy everything in one place. Even Christian Grey from Fifty Shades was less suspicious than this, and he made a joke about the TV show The Fall where he played the serial killer. Now we need to talk about finales really quick, if we are going to address the death of Crystal, Rossi's wife. So one thing a character on the show can never be is completely happy. You need conflict to keep the show going. A story without conflict isn't a story, it's an advert. There's no conflict in the Meerkat movies adverts for that exact reason. Oh, by the way, me and my mates have a bet on how long it'll be before we get a Meerkat movies movie. I'm very, very surprised it hasn't happened yet. Anyway, one of the advantages of a show ending is that a character can finally be happy. Doug and Carrie can finally have their baby, Monica and Chandler can finally move to the suburbs, Pam and Jim no longer have to work at a paper company, you can finally put an end to the ever turning wheel of a character's life and box it up in a satisfying little way, like they did with everyone in the end of Criminal Minds. Of course, when that show gets rebooted, you suddenly have to readdress those decisions. Hence, the death of Crystal. You need the conflict to fuel the characters and the show. I have zero doubt that if Reed had returned for this, then they would have killed Diana instead of Crystal. So it's probably best that he didn't return, because otherwise, they would have to have given him his own tragedy. They sure did like to kick Reed on that show, didn't they? My favourite part of the reboot so far is when Rossi talks about how the pandemic affected serial killers. Now, you may have heard me talk about my podcast Spooks and Crooks on here before, but if not, then you should know I'm a huge true crime fan. I never thought about what happened to serial killers during the pandemic. I think that's fascinating, and I'd love it if they dove more into that in future episodes. It's really sad to see how far Rossi has fallen. Seeing him eat microwaved mac and cheese was pretty heartbreaking. He was always so proud of his cooking skills, making various pasta dishes, and the microwave pasta shows just how unlike the Rossi we all loved he has become. Remember that episode where he taught everyone how to make pasta? What has happened, Rossi? I need to take a moment to compliment the actors real quick. There were two scenes which stood out to me above the rest. Both starred Joe Mantenegger, who is an incredible actor, even in Baby's Day Out. The first scene I want to talk about was when he and Prentice talked about how Rossi had been blocking himself off from the team ever since Crystal's death. I was tearing up. I've been moving towards making my own content for a while now, short films and TV pilots, and never have I been so scared of their idea than when I was watching these two actors act their hearts out. How I could ever make something even a tenth as good as this scene is beyond me. Incredible actors. The other scene I want to mention is when Rossi is comforting Penelope when she's struggling to return to the job. The way he touches her shoulder and she awkwardly taps his hand, such a subtle, beautiful moment. Splendid acting from both of them. I'm a bit worried about this dog, if I'm being honest. 
We saw a dog in the end of episode 2, and that guy is definitely going to kill the woman the dog belongs to, and I don't want the flu to get hurt. The name of the third episode is called Moose, which is the name of the dog, so hopefully it's a good sign that he may make it. And did anyone else notice the empty chair at the end of episode 2? Someone is definitely joining the team this season, or maybe even Reed will make a reappearance, who knows? Ultimately, I absolutely adored these two episodes. I'm genuinely excited to have the gang back. I could watch these people solve crimes for the rest of my life. It's honestly even better than I expected. I love the darker and grittier tone. It's more cinematic, very reminiscent of Mindhunter and True Detective. So what did you think of this episode? Well, these two episodes and Criminal Minds Evolution so far. Let me know in the comments below. Right then, I'm going to call it an end there, but before you go, please leave a like and subscribe. You can always unsubscribe for a later date if you don't like Rampo, and it's completely free and no hard feelings. Right then, I'm going to give my voice a rest. <laughs> Whoa, post-Covid, whoa. Right, bye folks. Go watch these videos here.